So in the day, the root of it was he can weave the and touch up money, but then you start seeing how your class is not taken care of you now. And then you start seeing how uh, the class really sucked. And then you start, you start it's just steam rolls. You can't see correctly, you can't see properly when you're operating in self-pity, when you feel sorry for yourself. And that mechanism of self-pity was never, never meant for you. God didn't give it to you, you go, oh, you know, He gave it to you to have compassion. It's a twisted, it's a twisted form of compassion. When you see someone, you have compassion towards them, you see them in the street, or, or someone sitting next to you, and you just have this inkling and this desire to encourage someone, or to talk to someone. Ever had that feeling before? Ever see it when you sat next to someone, and you don't know what it's about, but you just have this drawing towards them to comfort, this drawing towards them to assist them, or this, this, this need, it's what God's placed inside of you, and what this self-pity does, it turns it inward to yourself. And a lot of us are full of self-pity, feel sorry for ourselves, condemnation comes. We made the mistakes, it's constant to our actions, but we feel sorry for ourselves. We don't feel sorry for our moms and our dads, what we put them through. We don't feel sorry for our loved ones, what we put them through. We feel sorry for ourselves. Me. And you can never change your life if that's what it is. And I think that's one of the beauties of being in a place where you can focus on self. Is that you can see what you need to see. But a lot of us don't want to look. Because it is painful. It is painful. It's painful. It's painful to look at the mistakes you made and the things you've lost. It's painful. And it's, and it's easy the enemy can come and turn it in on you where you become full of self-pity. Feeling sorry for yourself. How many people have you met that are feeling sorry for themselves, that are down, that make a life for themselves? That are super successful, they're charismatic and they make friends. And anybody seen that? The person that's moping around and they're like the, the life of the party. <laughs> no, never. It, it's, the enemy steals from you when that. Blocks and ashes to recover. What's one of the blocks to recover? Self-pity. It's a block to recovery. It doesn't matter how you see it, it doesn't matter how you justify why you're feeling sorry for yourself. It is a block to recovery. It's a principle. <coughs> it's like gravity. I like using gravity. It's just something else. It's like the law of lift. I'm going to get something more to it. It goes against gravity. I'm going to go there. Self-pity. No, no, in any situation, there's no way where it says, okay, blocks and ashes. Acid. To recovery is self pity only when. You see that? You see anything intermixed there where it says, okay, this is this counts when you're having a bad day. These blocks, these blocks don't count when you're having a bad day. This never. It's the same, doesn't matter how you feel about it. It's the same, doesn't matter how you justify the things you feel for yourself. Israelites, eh? Inconvenience walking through, being being freed from slavery. Where where all they did all day, every day was work. Like, yeah, this work. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yes, 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 right. <laughs> yeah, they've got movies on a Friday night, they did worship on a Wednesday night, you know, they did like, journaling. <laughs> These are like all set to journaling in Egypt. <laughs> no! <laughs> they were treated like slaves. So from when the sun came up until when the sun went down, they worked. They worked. And it got so bad at one stage that Moses tried to set, get them out there on, on behalf of God. It got so bad that they even removed their ability to do the work. So now they didn't help them do the work. You know, one of the, one of the biggest things you need to, to get a job done, especially in the restaurant industry, make sure the people have the right tools. It's, it's, make sure they've got the right tools. They took away their tools and said you were stolen. Make the same quote. And then the inconvenience for them was leaving and, and going to a, a promise, a hope, which all have now. We're like in a wilderness situation now. We, we yeah, and we've got this promise, this hope. We can sort of see it, and then uh, we'll be here uh, another extra month, or we'll be here uh, for six months, or we'll be here uh, now for two months, and how we in the last six months. Not realizing there's hope being produced in you. Have you not noticed that? There's a guy here leaving in the near future, which I, it's amazing how time flies. But I can see in his eyes, there's hope for you. When you arrive there, not much hope. And all these ideas, but not much hope. That's what God will produce That's what God will produce in you in the process. Is that hope? So it's producing the hope. And He wants you to go to the rocks like self-pity, because it prevents the hope. <coughs> he wants you to have hope. Hope is an expected end. Have an expectation that tomorrow's going to get better, or today's going to get better, or opportunities will get better. Because when you think like it, guess what you start attracting? Guess what you start seeing? Not because they never existed. When you're self-pity, you don't see it at all. When you start producing hope again and you don't allow self-pity, you start looking towards others and start offering that compassion. Instead, you start seeing what you need to see and you'll take the opportunities you need to take. So you need to get over it. 
You need to stop allowing everything that makes you feel uncomfortable, feel sorry for yourself. We've got extras today. Okay. All right. Did you die? No. <laughs> Anybody die from extra? Anybody here? Anybody got punishment and you picked it? I mean, we had to resuscitate you, but I don't know that we can. But that's what we do. We, we freak out so badly we feel sorry for ourselves. We don't realize it's actually not making us weaker. Anybody that goes through extras, anybody that goes through punishment, anybody that goes through consequence, no one gets weaker because of it. Who's not weaker? Anybody got weaker, please? What, what's our problem? It's like, praise the Lord, hallelujah, I'm going to get stronger. That's how it should be. Thank the Lord for the correction. <laughs> awesome. It does. I mean, that's what's changed my life, is the correction. Me allowing the correction, because we're so rebellious a lot of the times, we, we allow no correction. If we come here and the person that's giving us correction is imperfect, so we don't want to receive the correction, we want the principle. Huh? If the person's fat or skinny or nasty or kind, that principle's principle remains the same. Correction is correction. When you receive correction, it makes you teachable. It is the principle. I remember when the Lord spoke to me during one of my pity parties. Who's this choice man, huh? <laughs> I had a pity party. Yeah, yeah that's what made her issue yesterday because she started seeing it and she started changing it. So if she started seeing something and started changing something, it doesn't mean the same principle works for us. See it and change it. And a lot of times in the book she speaks about everybody else. Like okay, she mentioned how the process was where she was outwardly focused where all the people made her feel bad. And then she was whoa, 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 whoa. Let me stop changing that. And what happened? Her life changed. And then she was really Christian, by the way. It didn't happen on the got born again, got saved, and then her life changed. No, she went through the whole process once she got saved. Then God started showing her what she needed to see, and she started changing it. And this, these are one of the things that she saw. It says here, He said, Joyce, you can be pitiful or powerful. I like that. What do you prefer? Being powerful or pitiful? Powerful. 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 Okay, then we'll walk it. Walk it. Only one of you wants to be pitiful. Put your hands up. Anybody want to be pitiful instead of powerful? Okay. No, <laughs> no one, no one, yeah. So what's our problem? It's a choice you need to make. There's your choice. It's about choice. There's your choice. I'm going to feel sorry for myself, or somewhere inside myself I'm going to believe that this is a season. But it is a season. Everything is a season while you're alive. Everything. So one thing you're going through that isn't a season. And what happens when our season is to hold us back? Imagine a farmer being stuck in winter. For four years and then complaining that he never reaped the harvest or so. Imagine doing that. But that's what we do. We have to get winter and go, oh, this winter is so cold. It's really cold. And you start feeling sorry for yourself. And then it becomes spring and summer and you're warmly dressed. But because you're feeling sorry for yourself, you don't realize it's warm. So you get sweaty and stinky. And that's how you like it. Then winter comes again. You're oh, it's just, it's just so cold. And people you've missed, but missed the whole season of so, sorry. Missed the whole season of reaping. That's how our lives work. That's how God works. That's how God works. And sometimes we sow the seeds in our garden and it's not lacquer. Sometimes we've got a fruit that's not lacquer. So get rid of the fruit and plant again. So don't plant pity, because you'll reap pity. But you cannot be both. You cannot be both. You, it's impossible. It even says that a, that a stream cannot produce bitter and sweet water. It produce one or the other. So don't the seed in what you're producing. This is a chapter that I don't want to skim over too quickly. It is vitally important to understand that we cannot entertain demons of self-pity. Underline it. A demon of self-pity. So, if, a demon, if it's a demon of self-pity, or it's, it's, a, it's a, a force of self-pity, a spirit of self-pity, who would want to submit to it? If, a, if the spirit of self-pity came and stood here, in front of us, who of you would get up and bow your knee and start worshipping? Anybody here? Anybody? Okay, I'll take it as a man. So those of you that can full of self-pity and feel sorry for yourself and think life sucks all the time and what am I still doing here? You know you, you're bowing down to the spirit. And if you can see what you're bowing down to, you'll get a huge fright. You'd run far away. So I suggest, understand what I'm saying, I run far away from it. Don't submit to it. And walk in the power of God. And walk in the power of God. Encourage and identify one another. When you're self-pity, when you feel sorry for yourself, are you able to encourage others around you? No. 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 You're actually taking him away from one another. If I walk around today and I'm feeling sorry for myself, imagine me calling you in my counselees. Oh, go to this bed. No, no, no. 
Do you guys like that? Yeah. 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 See, that's the thing. So I can have a bad day. <coughs> I'll try it today with you. Yeah. Just check it out. Yeah. Yeah, I'll do like a moat face. No. <laughs> it's moping. It's terrible. I'll, I'll take I'll take a look at it. And I'm not having a good day every day. I go through things mentally and, and emotionally and that. But I still need to do what I need to do and it makes me a better person for it and it makes me stronger for me. When you do what you need to do, despite the way you feel, that's actually when you grow. And when you're feeling good, ooh, nice, fantastic, try la la la, that's not when you grow. You just just read this emotional benefit, just read being feeling good. But today when you get up and you go, you don't feel good, and you do what you need to do, that's what you know. It's like Jimmy. Right? When does it come? you feel like Jimmy or you don't feel like Jimmy? You don't feel like Jimmy. Don't, it's, anybody that does training, anybody, aerobics or whatever, or whatever your thing is, rugby practice. So when you go then you feel good with benefits you, then you just enjoy it more emotionally. But when you do it and you play well or you try your best, despite the way you feel, that's actually when you become a better player. When you don't feel like doing the next rep, that's when you actually get stronger. Okay? Rocket science, gentlemen. I think the problem is because what our knowledge, we've all got knowledge. Every one of us are intelligent. Everyone, there's not one here that's not intelligent in their own way. You guys are clever, ladies and guys. Fantastic. But the problem is because your knowledge doesn't go hand in hand with the way you feel, you chuck it. So all of you are super intelligent. So you've got the knowledge, you know what to do, you get it, you're sitting here, you walk out of here. Now the feeling doesn't match the knowledge. So you choose the feeling over the knowledge. So we do, we choose the feeling over the knowledge. <coughs> Is that what you recommend to me? Let's say you're my counselor. Would you recommend me to do that? Okay, okay. Alright, if it doesn't make sense, the knowledge doesn't make sense to the feeling, rather choose the feeling, guys, you'll do well. Because <laughs> how many of us know we shouldn't use drugs? All of us know that. <laughs> We all know that. None of us sit there going, right, no, you know what, I need to read. But the damage is, that's actually a hoax. Uh, that's not the truth. Meth doesn't do that to your brain. <laughs> oh, no, no, it's not. Any of us sitting here thinking that right now? We all know it's damaging and it's bad for us. Every one of us. So why don't we change? Why do we have to come here to get some form of encouragement and, and guidance? Why? Because the feeling doesn't match the knowledge. Doesn't match the knowledge. Yes, you know what, just one more time. Maybe just put one or two more holes in my brain and then I'll stop. Let's <laughs> 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 it's a few more tablets. Maybe my kidneys won't shut down today. <laughs> <laughs> now we're here now and there's consequences to our actions. Let me just freak out. Because what happens, we know we need the help. But the way sometimes this place makes you feel, the knowledge doesn't make you feel it. So I'm just giving you a very big key today. Very big key today. Just because the knowledge doesn't match the feeling doesn't mean it's not the truth. And the funny thing is that feeling, the feeling of self-pity, can change by this afternoon. And now you want to make a decision on this morning because you feel sorry for yourself. You want to make a life-changing decision this morning and wonder why your life's crap this afternoon. How about waiting until that subsides and then make a decision? Based on the truth. Therefore, encourage, admonish, exhort one another, edify, strengthen, and build up one another just as you are doing. But it was hard for me to give up. Right? You give it up. Right? Give up self pity. See, there's a choice. There is a choice, you guys. There's a choice. You don't have to walk around with a big smile on your face when you're feeling sorry for yourself, but if you keep doing what you need to do to slap the feeling sorry for yourself, this will change from that. You'll smile anyway. You'll find the joy anyway. The minute someone hurts us, the moment we experience disappointment, the moment, as we've done all our lives, the moment we experience any form of disappointment, the demon comes and says, okay, let's build a stronghold. So if something happens that's not lacking for you today, or disappointing for you today, that moment you choose, what's it, you can't stop the birds from flying over your head, but you can prevent them from building a nest. So you can't stop certain situations happening, but you can prevent it from taking residency in your life. And we allow so many bad things to happen by choice, or by the areas we live in, or by the, by the places we hang out. So we go to a certain club, sooner or later you're going to bump into a, oh, that's a bit of a ding dong. It's an apple. And you're shocked when it happens, and it destroys your life, and you got beaten up at this club, and you're like, oh no, my life just sucks. You allow that temptation, and then, and then it started nesting in your life. The other thing is, don't take offense. 
key word. Don't take offense. When offense comes, when hurt comes, when pain comes, you're the one that decides to take it. No one else can make you take it. No one else. I had a scenario this morning, <coughs> was yesterday, where uh, in my past, obviously I've been running with people and I disappointed people and, and they didn't talk to me for a long time. And this person started talking to me and recently, and I wished them Merry Christmas and Happy Birthday. I just wished them Happy Birthday. And um, the way I remember them was by a certain way. So I responded, I responded back, fantastic. There's some form of reconciliation. Very nice. Guy. Very nice. Guy. Very gentle. Guy. Very gentle. Guy. And after all, he, he, he said to me, I'm going to stop with this certain story. But send regards to the family, I'm just who I am. So, meaning well, but just saying he doesn't like it. So, meaning I was like, yes, I need to man. My blood is like, like, so I said to him, I breathed, and I responded, and I said to him, that's the way I remember you. So it's a sign of respect towards you. But if that's the way you'd like me to address you, 100%. Have a great week. Nice talking to you. Yeah, and he responded well. At that moment, that moment in time, I could have easily taken that offense. And, oh, I messed up my morning. Yeah, I'm standing here now, I'm thinking self pity when I'm teaching self pity. And that's the choices you need to make. Offense comes, disappointments come. You decide to take it. No one can make it, no one can make you take it. He whispers lies about it. Life to us about how cruelly and unjustly we've been mistreated. We notice the more you stew on it, the more you stew on it, the bigger it grows, the bigger it grows, and you start planning how to kill people. You want the person just bumped you. <laughs> okay, you can get that far, we know that. We can take a small situation which is so large that we start thinking things that can end us up in prison. All you need to do is listen to the thoughts rushing into your mind during such times. Remember the one chapter in here? Think about what you're thinking about. And you will quickly realize how the enemy uses self-pity to keep us in bondage. Have any of you realized that by behavior that we've been in some form of bondage? You notice? Like every one of us, things we've done wrong. We don't wake up in the morning and say, let me make so much trouble today that my family doesn't want to talk to me. Does anybody do that? I don't know, I'm actually, this is not, that for years my dad won't talk to me. Let me, let me do this. And I'm looking forward to not speaking to my dad for a few years. None of us do it. That's bondage. It's deception. We allow those negative feelings and negative thoughts to keep us in bondage. So if you know that this road is not good for you, why do we keep it around us? If we can feel the self-pity and, and, and the negativity is not good for us, in, how, how, with common sense, can you justify keeping it there because someone takes you off the How? You can't. You can't. The Bible, however, gives us liberty to feel sorry for ourselves. The Bible, however, does not give us liberty to feel sorry for ourselves. Sorry, guys. <coughs> reverse. The Bible does not give you the liberty to feel sorry for yourself. It's a no-no. Who's heard of King David? Hey, King David? Let's just turn to 2 Samuel 12. A very famous or very popular scripture you always hear, they say that King David was a man of his own heart. You know, committed murder, committed adultery. Uh, wow. Uh, he had secrets about certain things. And that, 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 that scripture about being a man of the God's own heart. You think, but how can he be a man of the God's own heart? I mean, he does this and he does that. And, and, and I think this is, this is the attitude that he had. He must probably had a big part to play God saying he's a man of the man and heart. So I don't read you what happened here. I hope it's the right one. If it isn't the right one, I'll stop talking about they get this one and they get that one. I'll tell you the story with my, with my own uh, son. David, therefore, the soft God for his child. Now what happened was, background, uh, there was Bathsheba. Bathsheba, and what happened is, here we go. Two Samuel, soft Genesis. And what happened was, uh, he, had, he stepped with her during the war while well, uh, Uriah was out at war. Found out that she was pregnant, brought him back, tried to convince him, watch this for concrete. Tried to convince him, no, no, don't. Now the, the, rule, of, the, rule, the rule was at that time, if you're a big warrior, you come back. You don't spend time, any time with your family until the king and the, and, the, and, the, and the thing is safe. So you can't go have sex, you can't go and party, you focus on the war. So he brought him back and he encouraged him to go and be with his wife. 
And because you're such a man of honor, you refused. He said, no, 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 I can't. He stepped outside. Watch this. David just stepped with his wife. She's just born and pregnant. He stepped outside the door. This warrior. That's how much he loved David. Think about it. That's how much he loved David. That he stepped outside his door to protect the king during the time of war. David messed up because David was supposed to go to war and his generals convinced him to stay away because the last fight he had, he almost lost his life. So they wanted to protect the head. But he disobeyed God. There's a disobedience. There the disobedience happened. There he saw the shepherd. There he got impregnant. And he rise like one of his mighty men was your right? The Gittite. But he did make an flip. His oaks not sleeping his wife. But he told these generals to put him in the front lines. And the front line guys had a big chance of dying. Even though he was a mighty man, there was an intense war, and you find many times that the wars they fought, a lot of people would fight against them. So you put him in the heat of the battle, where the battle was fierce. And the chance of him dying was great, despite fighting being a great warrior. So he did die. When he died, David took her, as his wife, and she gave him birth. And this is where the story takes off. So he David, okay, then Nathan departed, the, 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 the prophet came and spoke to him, verse 15, and the Lord struck the child that Uriah's widow had born to David, and he was very sick. So the child was born, and he was sick, very sickly baby. So if it was done, she would be in an incubator, and all this, and, 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 and yellow, well, everything was wrong with this child. And it says that David therefore besought God for the child, and David fasted and went in and lay all night repeatedly on the floor. See, the whole time, like on the floor, and praying, and repenting, and, 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 and. And his older house servants arose in the night and went to him to raise him up on the floor, but he would not, nor did he eat food with him. So you can see he's feeling very bad, feeling very sorry for himself. Look, his child's sick, but at the same time he knows what he's done. So not like his child is sick, he knows what he's done to one of his warriors. He knows what he's done, he's wrong. And the prophets just rebuked him. So he's like, oh, feeling sorry for himself, and the child's dying, and he's hoping God will change the whole situation around. <coughs> and on the seventh day, the child died. The child died. Now watch this. I want to show you something. David's servant feared to tell him that the child was dead. David could kick some butt, guys. He could, like, he was a serious dude. He wasn't like us that think he's serious dude. So he was a serious dude. <laughs> <laughs> while the child was yet alive, he said, David's servants feared to tell him the child was dead, for they said, while the child was yet alive, he spoke to him, and he, could, he would not listen to our voices. So while the child was alive, he was crying, and he was on the floor, and they couldn't console him, they couldn't get him to eat. He says, but now the child has died, he says, Will he then harm himself to commit suicide? Do you think suicide is huh? self, it's a, a huge form of self pity? You feel sorry for yourself, your life sucks, and and and. And I do know what it's about, by the way. I do know. You know I think most of us have been there somewhere. If we tell him the child is dead, but when David saw that his servants were in the corner, obviously clever enough, and he perceived that the child was dead, so he said to them, Is the child dead? And they said, Yes. He is. Obviously, ooh, the okay, he's dead. And then David watched what he did. And David arose from the floor, washed, anointed himself, changed his apparel, and went to the house of the Lord and he worshipped. Wow. Wow. And he says, Then he came to his own house, and when he asked, they set food before him, and he ate. Then his servant said to him, What is this that you have done? They were shocked, because he's been waiting for seven days, and he's up, and he's bath, and he's clean, and he's doing his duties as a king. He says, you fasted and wept while the child was alive, but when the child was dead, you arose and ate food. David said, while the child was alive, so alive I fasted and wept, for I said, who knows that the Lord will be gracious to me, and let the child live. But now he is dead. Why should I fast? Can I bring him back again? I shall go to him, and he will not return to me. He was able to understand that when the situation is dead, you have many situations out there that are dead, and that makes you feel sorry for yourself. If only, if only. That job I used to have, that <coughs> wife I used to have, the guy I used to have, all these things. That, and what has happened? Those things are dead. They were dead. While they were still alive, at least you can pray. See, you're still married now. You can pray for your marriage, and you can believe for the marriage, and and and. But while that thing is dead, they don't see that he's feeling sorry for himself. It's dead. And how many things have you still got alive in your life that's causing self pity in your life when the thing is dead? What do the devils do to you guys? He's keeping you in bodies of something that happened in the past. It's dead. It's gone. There's two grits of compassion, which is having godly pity towards others who are hurting and spending our lives relieving relieve, relieve, relieve their suffering. But self-pity is perverted because it is taking something that God intended to give to others and turning it in on yourselves. So guess what you're being? When you're walking around in self-pity, you're being selfish. Because there's someone here today that might need 
you were encouraging. Mm -hmm. And because you're in self pity, you went to You went to see. Love is the same way. Romans 5 5 says that the love of God has been shed abroad, shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost. He has done this so we might know how much God loves us and that we may be able to love others. I think that we've done the greatest, biggest breakthroughs in our lives when we understand and realize how much God actually loves us. When you understand it, you can reject it out. When we take the love of God meant to be given away and turn it towards ourselves, it becomes selfishness and self centeredness which actually destroys us. There's never, ever any moment where self pity or feeling sorry for yourself has done you any good whatsoever. Never. Not even once we've done anything. Not even once. Just one time where feeling sorry for yourself has benefited you. Where, where things were added to you. Where you got that deal when you were feeling sorry for yourself. Or what? You were able to ask the person to say, I'll marry you because you feel sorry for yourself. <laughs> Huh? Okay, I won't leave you now because you're feeling sorry for yourself. And the, the same thing is many times we've been in destructive relationships and we use self-pity to manipulate that person to stay with us. And they stay with us not because they want to stay with us, they stay with us because they're scared when they commit suicide. The thing is you know it in your heart and that's why you keep being jealous, that's why you keep complaining, that's why you keep complaining. Self-pity is idolatry. Ooh. Did you ever think of that? You're making yourself an idol. You are God in your life. Turning in on ourselves, concentrating on us and our feelings. It makes us only aware of ourselves and our own needs and concerns. And that is certainly a narrow-minded way to live. We all, we, all, we all rate ourselves as free thinkers, open-minded thinkers. Huh? Well, if you've been full of self-pity and you're worrying about the past all the time, it makes you narrow-minded. You're not as sharp as you think you are. Think of others. Think about what you're thinking about. How about thinking of others? Let each of you esteem and look upon and be concerned for not merely his own interests, but also each for the interests of others. I'm telling you, one of the most liberating things for me as a father is to understand that I don't live myself, that I need to make sure, I need to do my part, and make sure that my sons that have, it's a generative thing. I understand. So I know I do well at, at work or do well at whatever because of me. Huh? I get the benefit of feeling good about it, but it's, I, do, I must do well because of them. I need to do well as a counselor or do well as a teacher, not because of me, I get the benefits of feeling good about being well of it, but because of you. And since I'm more concerned about me being a good teacher or me being a good counselor or me being a good father, and it's about me, 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 this what I tell you, you know, myself, make myself the idol. Same as giving money away. You might give money away, you might give money away. God smiles at you, doesn't smile at you. Why? You both get the same amount away. Okay? He's a respective person. No, no, because he can see your heart. You can see that you're doing it to get the praise and you're doing it because you know it's the right thing to do. Let each be esteemed and look upon and be concerned for not merely his own interest but also each for the interests of others. Recently one of our speaking guys was unexpectedly cancelled. He's like when they cancel class I'm so upset. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm joking. It's important. I'll say he gets upset. I can see you guys as when they cancel class. <laughs> it was what one I had been looking forward to, and initially I was a bit disappointed. And that happens, man. Sometimes we look forward to something here. Maybe you, look for, you were looking forward to leaving. <laughs> right? so even Joyce Meyer understands this. Right? You were looking forward to your future speaking engagements outside of Jericho. Now it's been cancelled. Right? And I was a bit disappointed. There was a time when an incident like this would have thrown me into a fit of self-pity, criticism, judgment of other party, and all kinds of negative thoughts and actions. Is it like that? I'm not saying that we were in a position, I don't say we don't do that, but we, we might start doing it, but then we see it. Be upset about something, some change in my life, something I go, oh, and I start like it freaks me out. I had the news last night and something was told to us and, and it freaked me out. But as I was sitting there, I was like, oh man, this, this is not good. Right, huh? But I can actually hear that sense God saying to me, look, I'm, I didn't make a mistake. This is what I wanted to do, and that I, just, I was he just said to me that God's not confused. I'm not confused. And I was able to release. Sometimes we need to understand God's bigger than, than us. Do you not know that? Huh? We see what he's been able to create. And we think we're bigger than him. Or our situations are bigger than him. 
truth. We're the only one that given permission though to operate in our lives. The scripture says we walk by faith, not by sight. We walk by faith, not by sight. And a lot of times when we allow these feelings and emotions to overtake us, guess what we do a lot of the time? Do we walk? We might run around asking. But do we walk? Do we walk forward? Do we go forward? Walking is a sense of going forward. Can you have a sense if someone walks? If you hear someone say they're walking by faith, you picture Abraham walking like this. Anybody? No. Um, you picture Abraham hanging around a certain environment, he's trying to stay in the same season, partying out, partying there, you know, just, everything just stays the same. And, you know, two years later, you're still with the same hairstyle, you're still at the same place. <coughs> and you're wondering, yes, man, where are all my friends going? <laughs> have you happened to you before? You go over there, you've been here for years and years and years, and the same friends you used to have and, and see, they're gone. And you're still there. That's not walking. <laughs> Standing still. That's circling. That's hustling. That's getting confused. So walk. Keep walking. Keep walking by faith. Keep moving forward by faith. And as you keep moving forward, God will honor you. So whatever the situation is, something happens and you feel sorry for yourself, and you keep moving forward by faith, God will honor you. He will change the situation. So you're good. Stand still is difficult. It's like saying, okay, not like her. Okay, God, change my life, change my life, change my life, change my life. He's saying, look, I need you to walk there. <laughs> I'm thirsty. I'm just so thirsty. And you're like, oh, there's no water here. What am I going to do? Give me the water. <laughs> The water's in. You get, you get so angry with God. You get upset with God. And how could He? And God's like saying, well, I love you, man. The water's there. <laughs> and you sit down on the floor and you feel sorry for yourself. So you get more and more dehydrated. And instead of using water, you use milk. <laughs> <laughs> And then it gets worse, then it comes to the end of you. <laughs> and we get more upset with God because where's the flippant water? <laughs> this way of thinking and this way of making this available to everyone of you. One of the nicest things I enjoy about where I'm at is I can laugh at myself. How many of you laugh at yourself? Like, oh, you stupid ass. I mean, I'm just like, wow. How can I think that? How can I, what? What's wrong with me? No. Oh, wow. You know? I sometimes find myself being angry about something and then I start apologizing to God. Okay, oof, no, wait, I'll be here. As I said, quietly, God began to show me the situation from the viewpoint of other people involved. They had been unable to locate the building in which to hold the meeting. And God showed me how disappointing it was to them. They were counting on the meeting, looking forward to it, to it with great expectation, and now they could not have it. It is amazing how easy it is to say out of self-pity, if we look at other person's side and not just at our own. Self-pity is supported by thinking only of ourselves and no one else. And saying there's many times when we demand something, especially when we are not realizing the effect it has on those around us, not only at the center. If one of you run away, if you don't understand, even though you justify it, this place, you justify running away. Do you understand? You can ask guys to be your fault. Do you understand how to fix the rest of the camp? Do you understand it? Do you understand you throw your toys in the cart and you act like a bit of a... Do you understand you affect everybody else? Do you understand if you phone your mom and dad and you demand them to fetch you now? Do you understand the concept of getting in the car, driving through, and now they've got to figure out how other else to help you? Do you understand that? No. So why don't you start understanding? That's one thing I understand. If I go now and I get hammered, I'm not good to my family. I'm not good to my family. I must be laugh a bit more when I'm at home. <laughs> be more relaxed when I'm at home. But I'm not good to them. There's no growth. Maybe have some fun with me and then ask you to get high again so they can have fun with me. I'm joking. <laughs> but there's no growth. No growth. We literally exhaust ourselves sometimes trying to gain sympathy. Eh? Is it? Eh? Yeah. Well, and then and we're angrier because no one's showing us attention that we want. Hey, get like really angry. My counselor's not seeing me. They can see him upset. They get like angry about. Come on, guys. Come on, guys. An addiction is something done as an automatic response to some stimulus. So it's a reward system. So we do what we do because we get a certain reward. So when we, so a lot of times we get ourselves that when we are full of self-pity, we actually manipulate. Because we know that 
so we know that the response will be from our loved ones. They'll come to us to rescue and they'll be there for us and they'll enable us and oh you need to pay the rent, no problem, my boy. Mm. <laughs> you might not think it yeah. You might not think it yeah, but look at your fruit. Look what happens. We come and tell you, look at you bearing out you 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 doing this and oh no, it wasn't my intention, okay? Then why does it look like an apple? <laughs> huh? No, I didn't know, no, but it's an apple, it's a flippin' apple, man. But it wasn't my intention. Hello? <laughs> I didn't mean to sleep with that person, huh? What? <laughs> <laughs> no, no, I slept. <laughs> <laughs> but that's what you expect, so when someone cuts you out, or you're in trouble for doing something you shouldn't do, you, you immediately get upset for the person correcting you, and saying, was it wasn't my intention? You must understand you weren't treating me right. Ouch. It's an automatic response. Understand when I speak about a denial about coping? I don't know, your coping skills as a child? Who of you still children? Who of you still 8, 9, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11? Anybody here? Mm -hmm. What do you think happened to those coping skills? They're gone? No. Do you look like the same way you looked when you were seven, 6 or 7? Do you look like exactly the same? You had a beer in your system? Yes, you not. Hope not. You were sent for test. <laughs> But you look different to what you do in your life you're six or seven. Why? Because your body automatically matures. What do you think happens to that wrong thinking? What do you think happens to that wrong coping skill? It matures. It matures. Many of us would have used drugs if they were available in primary school. Yes. Many of us would have. If they were available like that, we would have started using way before. A lot of us are 13 or 14, started smoking when we were 11 or 12. And a lot of us, yeah, this old, sort of the certain generation. We were today, I think we would have started at 8 9. Sure. Mm. Uh, so, who you got to beat you? The system. Yourself. Yourself and what you submit yourself to. Father God, I want to thank you for this opportunity given us to speak truth, Lord. And I thank you that we will no longer submit to the spirit of self pity, but we'll, we will be powerful in what we do and show what we do, despite the way we feel. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.